Okay, we will uh, get started. So today our uh, goal is to study policy evaluation algorithms. So policy evaluation as such is not really uh, reinforcement learning, but it's one of the sub-elements of reinforcement learning. So I want to start with uh, the discussion on policy iteration algorithm where there was an agent whose goal was to apply operator M, send a policy mu to a critic, which does some simulation, and sends an approximation to J of mu an approximation to j of mu to the agent so that the agent can uh, compute a new policy mu again. Okay, so this was a cycle of policy iteration algorithm. And what we are going to discuss today is how do you use samples to help critic, okay? Because remember, the agent's problem is pretty simple. It just look at this value function and based on the value, run a one-step minimization problem to compute the policy mu. So this part is fairly straightforward. We don't necessarily have to do a lot of simulations for that. It's just a minimization problem or several minimization problems. But the critic one is where the samples from an actual system or from an actual simulator would be really useful in order to compute map mu to j of mu or some approximation to j of mu. Okay, so our goal is, uh, we are going to talk about two different algorithms. So one is TD Lambda temporal difference learning method. So TD Lambda algorithm, which is based on uh, Lambda policy iteration algorithm that we talked about in one of the previous classes. And the other algorithm we are going to talk about is uh, important sampling, adaptive important sampling based algorithm for evaluating J of mu, okay, based on simulations. <clears throat> and there, they are two completely different algorithms. There are very different flavors to these algorithms. So we'll talk about it today. So let me first talk about temporal difference method. TD lambda. So I want to recap the lambda policy iteration. This was, I think, lecture five, if I'm not. Yeah, I think it was lecture five. It was last Tuesday when we talked about lambda policy iteration. For some reason, I feel that I taught it long time back, but it was just last week, actually. So, <clears throat> so given the question there was given J and mu compute J updated, which is an approximation to J of mu. So this J is a vector. Uh, I'm using J. Uh, how should I differentiate between this? So this j is a vector, which is uh, a value function. It takes, uh, takes values in the space of value function. This is a function that maps the policy to the expected cost. Uh, OK, anyway, so this is, uh, let's just keep, uh, keep this uh, notation, e even though I'm, I'm overloading this uh, symbol j. So anyways, okay, so this is uh, given J and mu, we want to compute an approximation to J of mu. So this is the expected cost. With policy mu. And the idea was we defined a temporal difference dt of it, it plus one as C of it mu it it plus one min plus alpha j of it plus one 
minus j of i t. So this is how we define d of t. <coughs> I'm going to write it in a short form. So I'm going to suppress all these dependents. So I'm going to write dt equals to ct plus alpha j i t plus 1 minus j of i t. And then based on this, I define a function delta, which is, or a vector delta, which is summation t equals to 0 to infinity alpha lambda raised to t dt. Starting from I0, I compute this expectation and I store the value as delta I0 and I output it J updated is equal to J plus delta. And this is an approximation to J of mu. OK, so this is the recap. This is what we did in the last Tuesday. Now. The problem we are faced today is I can't compute this expectation. Okay. By the way, this expectation is under policy mu, so you're using the policy mu in order to compute the expectation. And the problem today is I have a simulator where I could simulate the trajectories using policy mu, but I cannot compute this expectation because I don't have the probability distribution. Okay. <coughs> so today, uh, we have a simulated data using mu. So I have I0, C0, I1, C1, and so on. And I want to map it. So I have j, mu, and this trajectory. And I want to map it to some approximation of j of mu. <clears throat> That's the goal. Questions? Okay. Now, one thing I want to make a note here if this j was equal to j of mu, what would happen? My question is if, the, if this j was equal to j of mu, so I started with a value function which itself is uh, equal to the expected value with that policy, what exactly is going to happen? What would the value of this delta be? Zero? Why would that be? Why would delta be equal to zero? Why would this be equal to zero? Okay, so what happens if this j was equal to j mu? So j was equal to, let me write it here, uh, fact 
j equals to j mu implies what does it imply expected value of dt is equal to expected value of dt is equal to yeah the intuition should be that it needs to be zero, otherwise J updated won't stabilize. Right. So expected value of dt will be equal to zero. Uh, I'm kind of surprised that nobody answered because uh, I hoped it should be obvious. But anyways, let's go over it very quickly. So expected value of dt will be equal to zero, which implies delta will be equal to zero. Okay, so this is a fact that we should all remember. Okay, so why should this be the case? So what does J mu satisfy? So J mu of i is min over u c of expected value of c of i u. No, 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 there is no min value of u. It is under a specific policy. So this is expected value of c i mu i j plus alpha j mu j right this is the fixed point that the uh, that the bellman equation has to satisfy if you're using a policy mu and and in expected value of dt is the same as this expectation minus j mu i if j was equal to j mu okay so that's why it should be equal to 0 that's why it should be equal to 0 because this equation holds okay i hope it's clear to everyone now why that fact is true Okay, so I start with some vector j, start with some policy mu. Um, my j updated will be close to j of mu, right? But if I start computing delta again and again with respect to j updated, eventually I am going to converse to the situation where delta will be equal to zero and j will converse to j mu. <clears throat> so that's the idea of lambda policy iteration. Okay, now, now that this idea is clear, let's see what happens when we have simulation, simulated data. Okay, so I'm going to erase this side. Question. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm confused, like, how is the upward policy obtained from this address? Oh, so you, this is just the critic part. This is just the critic part. So you get J mu, then it goes to agent, then it gives you another policy mu, then it goes through the critic part. So I'm just focusing on critic today. We're not looking into the actor part. Okay. <clears throat> uh, any other question? So let's look at a simulation data. Uh, I'm just making things up. Uh, so this is time. I have a three state system, state, and I have the cost. So zero, I am at state one. The cost is C zero. Then at time one, I am at state two, C one. Sorry, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, C2, C3, C4, C6, and so on. I've just made it up, a simulated trajectory. I have only three states, 1, 2, and 3, and I'm getting some cost samples from the simulator or from some real-world data. <coughs> Okay. 
Okay, so I'm given J, I have given mu, and mu produces this trajectory, the state trajectory, and I want to compute an approximation J of mu. All right, so let's define tau i k, which is the kth time state i was visited. The technical uh, term for this is stopping time. Okay, so it's a stopping time that determines, not determines, but that stores at what time state i was visited, kth number of time. So state one is visited the first time at time t equals to zero. So I'm going to define tau 1, 1 equals to 0. What about the second time state 1 was visited? When is the second time when state 1 is visited? t equals to 2. When is the third time state 1 is visited? 6. Let's look at tau 2, 1. That's equal to 1 tau 2, 2, that's equal to 3, tau 2, 3 is equal to 5, and the same thing you can define for state 3 as well. Now, I want you to think about, based on this simulated trajectory, uh, how do I know what's the expected cost, or what's a sample of a cost starting from state one? So samples of cost starting from state one. So I'm just looking at state one, and I want to know what's the total cost I'm going to accrue if I start from state one. Okay, reasonable question to ask. So what's the first sample I can get? So that's simple, because I'm starting from state one, I have C0 plus alpha C1 plus alpha square C2, alpha raised to n, or alpha raised to t, Ct. Okay, that's the first sample. What's the second sample for this cost? C2 onwards, right? So C2 plus alpha C3, alpha square C4, alpha raised to TCT. What's the third sample? Starting from C6, Alpha C7, C8. Is this clear to everyone? This is the most important point of this lecture. Okay? So from the same trajectory generated by the policy, I can get multiple samples of the cost starting from state one. And the reason why I can make this assertion is because it's a Markov decision problem. The past is independent given the present state, okay? <clears throat> now, 
Now, uh, these are all random variables, C1, C2, C3, all of these are random variables. Uh, let me call this V1, V2, V3. Are these independent random variables or dependent random variables? Sorry? Dependent, right? Because there are so many other random variables that are common to both these V1 and V2. Okay, so V1 and V2 and V3, these are all correlated random variables. But they have the same distribution, okay? Because they are coming for, they are the cost corresponding to starting from state one. So we know two facts. First, V1, V2, V3, and so on are identically distributed. And the second fact is V1, V3 are correlated. They're not independent. What is a good estimator for the cost, given that we have three or maybe multiple samples of these identically distributed? Well, just the average. Um, just the average, right? So you did this in assignment one, problem one. So a good estimate of average cost, summation of vi over n, i goes from one to, well, Oh, I'm using I. Uh, let me use something else. I is the state, so uh, K. Have I used K so far? Oh, K is the kth time. J is also a state. M, N, R is reward. Uh, sorry? P, P, have, oh, P is probability. <laughs> uh, P, Q, R. L, no. yeah. Have we used L so far? No, we have not. Okay, so I'm good. I can use L. Uh, yeah, okay. So this is a good estimator, but uh, as you have seen in assignment one, if there is correlation, the variance could be good or bad, depending upon whether the correlation is positive or negative, right? Okay, it turns out that this way of estimating the average cost is consistent. Estimator, which means as n goes to infinity, this converges to the average cost. So if you have infinitely many times when state one is visited, you can just take the average of all these cost samples that you have accrued and that will give you, uh, you can take the empirical average and that will give you the J of mu starting from state i as n goes to infinity. Uh, okay. Let me write it as limit n goes to infinity. This is a consistent estimate. So consistent means as you increase the number of samples, it will converge to the average cost. But naturally, we can't wait for n going to infinity. We have to graduate at some point of time. I mean, you have to graduate, I don't. Uh, so you cannot let n go to infinity, so you'll have to terminate this simulation at some point of time, let's say n equals to 10,000. Then it gives you not a, con not a uh, it gives you a biased estimate. So for finite n, gives a biased estimate. So it gives you a consistent estimator. You have to use Wall's identity to prove it. It can be proven, not a big deal. Uh, but for finite n, it gives you a biased estimate of j mu i. So there is an error, okay? So we don't like that error. 
But anyways, uh, that's what we have to live with. <clears throat> you, yeah. Could we characterize the error by the fact that we have some bound on what the maximum cost is and then and the length of the series uh, to an alpha? Not only that, you will also need to know what the mixing time of the Markov chain would be. Okay. <clears throat> mixing time means how many times one will be visited uh, during the entire run, because that will tell you whether the correlation is strong or correlation is large. So let's say, consider the following situation. Your alpha is 0 0.9, and state 1 is visited after every 100 time steps. Okay, so then there will be hardly any correlation between C0 and C100 because uh, the spacing is too far apart. So alpha raised to 100 will be very, very small and therefore it won't really matter. Uh, but for states that are visited very often, you will have a very strong correlation and it's not clear whether the correlation will be positive or negative. Okay. <clears throat> now you can think of it as follows. So this gives you a biased estimate. So let's do the following. Uh, let's just consider multiple runs of the same simulation. So this is simulation run number one. Uh, I just keep the sample V1 from the first run of the simulation. And then I run the simulation again, perhaps with a different starting state. And I look at the cost sample I've accrued starting from state one. Okay, so let's consider a second run. So T is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And the state would be 2, 3, 1, 1, 3, 2, 1. And the cost is C0 tilde, C1 tilde, C2 tilde, C3 tilde, and so on. And now instead of uh, averaging the cost from the same trajectory, <coughs> let me consider V2 to be C. 2 tilde plus alpha C3 tilde and so on. Okay? And I can construct V3 from the third run of the simulation in a similar fashion. Okay, so now I have changed the algorithm. Now the algorithm is I am only going to consider the first time it hits state 1. So I'm going to run multiple simulations. I'm going to consider the first time it hits state one and look at the cost accrued from that time onwards. And that will give me samples of cost starting from state i. So V1 is from the first simulator, V2 is from the second simulation, V3 is from the third simulation, and so on. I can run it parallelly over multiple servers. Now, I have that V1, V2, V3 are identically distributed, but now they are uncorrelated. Okay, so now they are uncorrelated because this is completely independent of V1, this is completely independent of V1 and V2, and so on. Okay, so they are two different versions of the algorithm. <clears throat> Everyone understands the difference between the two algorithms? Okay, so in one case we take a one log trajectory and try to estimate the cost. In the other case, I complete, conduct multiple simulations and then just look at the first time state one was visited and then look at the cost accrued from that time onwards. Now, the property of this particular estimator, you can still use this estimator, it's a consistent estimator, but now it's an unbiased estimator. And that's because it's uncorrelated. In this case, V1, V2, V3 are uncorrelated in the second situation. <clears throat> okay?
Okay. So now let's talk. Let's go back to our discussion about the lambda policy iteration. So what we talked about right now was two versions of TD lambda. The first version was, no, the first visit TD lambda and every visit TD lambda. Okay, so in every visit TD lambda, so let's think about it. In the first visit, my delta of i is given by summation t equals to tau i1 to infinity alpha lambda raised to t minus tau i 1 dt. <coughs> In the every visit, Any questions so far? Yes. For uh, DTs, what notionally the syntax tells us that there are over or different simulator runs, or is that just? Uh, so right now it's just one simulator at, at a time. So there is no multiple simulators. Um, in order to have multiple simulators, I'll have to sum over multiple runs of the same algorithm. I haven't introduced that part yet. Okay. So in the every visit, you have one long sequence. And from one that long one sequence, you have computed delta i. In the first visit, you have one long sequence. And you have picked delta i from, so this is, this is uh, similar to v1, which is just a single sample, OK? You just have one sample from a single run of the simulation. You don't have multiple runs of the simulation yet. Any question so far? Yes. Sorry? Yes, the policy will stay the same. You're not changing the policy. You're just evaluating the policy right now. OK? Remember, the topic today is policy evaluation. There is no change in policy so far. Okay. Okay. So in the first visit, 
td lambda we look at the first time ith state was visited look at the temporal difference the discounted temporal difference from that time onwards store it as delta i okay in the every visit td lambda we look at every time that state i was visited look at the rest of the temporal differences the discounted temporal differences okay and store it as a value of delta i and yeah so we we use this way to estimate j first and we use j to estimate d of t uh and then we no so you ha you are given j you are given mu and you want to get j updated okay okay so in order to remember dt the definition of dt was ct plus alpha j it plus 1 minus j it so you are given the j you are given mu which from which you are generating this trajectory and you are storing the data in the form of this delta i okay so multiplying it by alpha lambda raised to something multiplied by dt sum it all up okay <clears throat> okay so then the algorithm would be as follows you started from j0 and start from j0 get the trajectory get the dt get delta define j1 equals to delta 0 delta 0 in this particular fashion depending upon first visit or every visit beta 0 delta 0 then you have j1 get the trajectory get the dt get delta 1 and so on beta beta 0 beta 1 these are the step sizes they have to be tapering so they should be not summable but square summable yes uh so all the normalizing constant will be stored within this beta 0 okay so for instance if you are using first visit td lambda your beta 0 will be higher if you are using every visit td lambda then your beta 0 will be much lower okay so all the constants will get absorbed in beta 0 beta 1 and so on <clears throat> or alternatively you can put a normalizing constant here okay depending upon how many trajectories uh, how many of these tau i's you have and then not have those constants here in beta 0 beta 1 okay so these two are the um, td lambda algorithm proposed i think by let me not mess up the name but i guess it was proposed in 89 okay now watkins proposed q learning so it must be by certain okay so it was proposed around 1980s late 1980s and then a uh, 1996 a new variant was called restart td lambda where delta was 
uh, summation t equals to tau i 1 to tau i 2 minus 1. So this is delta i alpha lambda raised to t minus tau i 1 dt plus summation t equals to tau i 2 to tau i 3 minus 1 alpha lambda t minus tau i 2 dt and so on. The only difference between this and every visit is that the upper limit is not infinity anymore. And restart TD lambda outperforms. Both every visit and uh, first visit. Okay, that's just the property that was found empirically. so much uh, uh, you might lose something. Is that not the case found empirically or was it? Yes, that's exactly error? what's not. Yeah, so for most of the problems that the authors of the paper, and I forgot the name. I don't have the paper with me. I forgot the name of the authors. So um, the authors found that for the simulators that they were using, for the simulation problem that they were using, this one outperformed the other two. Um, and I'm not quite sure why that is the case. Okay, and there is no theoretical study done mm -hmm. on the restart TD lambda to show why that is the case. No. Uh, so this one converges, but the question is why does it converge faster than these two methods? And I don't know why that is the case. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this beta. Well, it does, but the uh, that I don't know. It's not clear from reading their paper why they mention this. Okay, I mean, what their beta selection rule was, I, I'm not very clear. Yeah. So we we talked about how to get the average cost estimator from the Vs using the yes. simulated trajectory. Yes. But that doesn't <coughs> directly give us the uh, DT doesn't. That doesn't give you DT. So DT is has a similar expression, which is CT plus alpha J minus J. Remember, DT is given by this expression. Okay. Oh, okay. Just using that for the next yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so there are three different types of TD lambda we studied. One is uh, first visit, then restart, then every visit. Uh, the difference is quite obvious. Here we don't have infinity. We have infinity here in the every visit. In the first visit, there is no extra term. There is just one term, starting from the first time state I was visited. So all of this can be written in a very straightforward way. using what is known as eligibility traces. So let's define Z M I. Uh, should I use M T? <coughs> Z T I as
ओके फर्स्ट विजिट Z0 I equals to zero. Zt I equals to one. If I equals to it, alpha lambda Zt I Zt plus one. Zt i equals to one if i is equal to i t alpha lambda Zt minus one if i is not equal to uh, ta t equals to tau i one t not equal to tau i one. That's much better. That's the first visit. T D lambda. Then every visit. So these are known as eligibility traces. So this is all eligibility traces. Then for every visit, Z T I is. Alpha lambda Z T I Z T minus one I plus indicator I T equals to I. And then I have to write restart. Z T of I alpha lambda Z T minus one I if I not equal to I T and one if I equals to I T. then delta can be written as z t i d t t equals to 0 to infinity questions <coughs> excuse me yeah except for the first three star delta i we no longer have a guarantee that delta i is finite correct this one the, that one will be finite the other ones we no longer have a guarantee will be finite in general that's a good question uh, so it is proven that this whole sequence is going to converge. The sequence is going to converge. So I'm not sure if they make the assumption that everything is finite in order to prove it. Oh, I see. Uh, Well, you have to make the assumption that in case alpha is equal to 1, which is the stochastic shortest path problems, all policies are proper. In case alpha is discounted, you want to make sure that the cost is bounded. Um, 
But if you go through the proof of stochastic approximation, typically either there is an assumption that your iterates are bounded or you can prove based on the structure of the problem that your iterates are bounded. So perhaps uh, these would be bounded with probability 1. So there could be occasional probability 0 event where it might get unbounded, but more or less it will remain bounded. <clears throat> Any other question? Yes. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> if you look at it, uh, what happens at t equals to tau i2? So many of the terms here would be, OK, so let's look at what happens with every visit case. OK, so every time you visit the state, so initially, first time you visit, it goes to 1, then it starts decaying. Then it jumps up by 1, then it starts decaying. Then again, it jumps up by 1, then it starts decaying, and so on. Uh, that's the, this is the trajectory of Zt. Zpi, this is t, and this is every visit. Okay, and that's if you collect all the dt terms together, uh, you get exactly this kind of update scheme. Uh, why don't you think about it in your free time, if you have any? Okay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so until you reach, until you hit the state i the first time. Um, you have zero eligibility trace. As soon as you visit it for the first time, this is equal to zero. Th this is equal to this is equal to zero. So your elig eligibility trace goes up by one. So that's where this one of i t equals to i becomes active. Then after that, it starts decaying until you reach tau i two. Okay. So when you reach tau i two, you have the old el eligibility trace this part, and then you have the new one starting from 1. Okay, so that's this one, and then the old one that gets. And this is what the eligibility trace is going to look like. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so this is uh, the offline TD lambda, offline because you generate the trajectory compute delta naught and then update j. Uh, you could have online td lambda where you, while you are updating the trajectory, you can compute delta 0 temporarily or dt temporarily and continue to update j. So that's uh, known as online form. So not much different, but it's just that the j gets updated far more frequently in the online version in comparison to online version, offline version. And the reason is you don't wait for the trajectory to end. You continue updating J as data gets generated. <clears throat> but otherwise, you have the same three ways of updating, which is first visit, every visit, and restart using this eligibility traces. OK? Uh, so this is offline. In the online, j t plus 1 equals to j t plus uh, beta t z t d t. So let me put i <coughs> okay. So this is the online version where JT continues getting updated as new data gets generated. Again, beta T is uh, not summable, but square summable. Yeah? Does the bias is that can occur when we're calculating J uh, flow through the TD lambda in any way to bias what we'll 
say, the approximate offer will be? Or is it something that effectively cancels out in the overall process? Uh, which, what part are you talking about? The because we have the uh, bias estimator yes. uh, when we're building a J to compute DT yes. from the simulation, does that bias, uh, depending on how you are calculating J, impact uh, our ability to estimate a J of mu as the critic, or is it something that is effectively canceled out? Ah, so, um, so you're talking about two time scales. So in, if you let k goes to infinity, uh, this, this iteration number go to infinity, everything converges. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what problem you're looking at. The issue is what happens in finite time. That part is something that is considered one of the open problems in reinforcement learning community. So nobody knows how to get the finite time bounds for the TD lambda type algorithms. <clears throat> Although people are looking at it now, like there have been uh, maybe 10, 15 papers that I've seen in the past few months working on finite time samples. Yeah. But it's a, it's a cool problem to think about, what happens in the transient. You know, the only place, the only class where I, I worry about transient is 3551. And after that, for some reason, transient goes out of the window. Nobody cares about the transient anymore. Everybody is interested in the steady state performance. But, uh, but the transient performance is important, as you have rightly pointed out. Whether the bias helps you or doesn't help you, I'm not, it's not clear. Any other question on TD Lambda? That ends the discussion on TD Lambda. So now I'm move, going to move on to important sampling. Oh, what's the result? The result is. Uh, reasonable assumptions imply JK would converge. Uh, this is JK would converge to J mu as K goes to infinity almost surely. <clears throat> and I want to point you to the right result. So this is page number 210 onwards in neurodynamic programming. So proof page 210 in neurodynamic programming book. It's a pretty long proof, okay, but it can be done. <clears throat> yeah. Are there conditions under which if you would want lambda to be a positive number, assuming it's bounded, of course, so that alpha lambda, lambda is always between zero and one. Okay, so there's no reason that you'd ever want to deviate that from lambda. Uh, no, not that I can think of. Yeah. Lambda is between zero and one. Any other question? Yes. So in that theorem, you suppose there is this What do you think? In a theorem, you mean the J mu? This mu is fixed. Mu is fixed. Two of the terms mu is fixed. So we are only doing policy evaluation, we are not doing policy okay. okay. Any other question? OK. So let's look at the second algorithm, which is important sampling. And uh, this algorithm actually triggered from physics, statistical physics uh, community, <coughs> where people were working on figuring out uh, through simulations for how long a particle is going to exist in the universe. Okay, so that was their question. So particle undergoes several transitions, and then it eventually transforms itself into a photon, and that's the death of the particle. Okay, so that's the invariant death state that we talked about in the stochastic shortest path problem. So you go to an invariant state, and then you remain in that state. So it turns out that those ideas of how to 
generate the trajectories of those particles and figure out what's the expected time after which the particle is going to die. That simulation is very similar to what we are doing when we do policy evaluation and reinforcement. Okay. There was this connection made somewhere in 1990s, perhaps uh, uh, early 2000. So that's what we are going to talk about. The only caveat here is importance handling. <clears throat> the only thing we require here is the model, the P, transition P mu should be one. P mu should be known, and from P mu, knowledge of P mu, we want to compute J of mu. <coughs> okay. Uh, so let me give you some background on important sampling, what exactly is this method. So consider. Let x be a state, uh, <coughs> let p be a distribution over x, okay. uh, and consider this problem. So integral of fx px dx okay, over the set x, this is the mean. Right? And let's say we want to compute this mean of the function and there is a simulator and I could sample x1, x2, iid from p, from the distribution p. So I have a simulator from which I can compute, you know, I can generate x1, x2 samples. How can I compute this mean? So well, I could let i equals 1 to n <coughs> and this would converge to the mean almost surely from the law of large numbers. So let me transform this expression as follows. So I define another probability distribution Q of X and we have function multiplied by some weighting matrix w of x multiplied by q of x d of x and it turns out that the mean with respect to the distribution q of fx wx is the same as the mean <coughs> with respect to probability distribution p of fx. So the goal here in important sampling is to compute Q, compute a distribution Q so that, okay, so before I jump to that, in this case I have summation fxi wi, so I generate samples x1, xn, iid from Q. 
and I have f x i w i no w of x i over m i equals 1 to m. This also converges to the expected value with respect to q of f multiplied by w. Right? So all of you agree with this. <coughs> Which is the same as expected value of p, expected value with respect to the measure p of the f function has. this way. So in the limit, all of them converges to the mean that we are interested in almost early. No problem. What happens when your number of samples is finite? One of them could be closer to mean in comparison to the other, depending upon the measure q that you have picked. Okay? So the idea in statistical physics and that has percolated into reinforcement learning now, the idea was that I could make a judicious choice of Q so as to use fewer number of samples to get an accurate estimate of mean. Okay. So the idea pick Q iteratively such that uh, mean or estimate of mean, so let me write it as mean hat, is computed quickly with fewer samples. <coughs> okay? So the way it works is <coughs> you start with some initial Q naught perhaps q0 is equal to p0, sorry p, and then you look at the estimate that you have seen so far, update the value of q, update the distribution q, uh, redo this uh, sampling, multiply the function with the weight divided by n, sum it up, uh, and then update q again and so on and so forth. Okay? So that's known as adaptive important sampling because you are adapting q with respect to the samples you have seen so far. Okay. So that's the algorithm we are going to talk about today. <coughs> the algorithm runs as follows. So you can transform a discounted MDP into a, uh, a shortest path problem. And this is given in your assignment. So it's a question in your assignment to show that you can transform a discounted MDP into a shortest path MDP. It can be done. So once you have done it as a shortest path MDP, then here is the algorithm you can try. So pick P0 equals to P. I J and some J I greater than zero. Uh, at time t, <coughs> generate i t plus 1 according to p t i t i t plus 1 i t comma j J T plus one or J T plus one eyes. One minus beta T. Okay. 
So I have updated my estimate of JT. Now I have to update PT plus one. So <coughs> oh, I need to define eternal T plus one.
minus plus 1 i j equal to c t i j for all i not equal to So those states that are not visited, you don't change the transition probability. The states that are visited, you have to change the transition probability. Uh, so you are only perturbing just one place. So you are only perturbing this particular. So you have a matrix. You are perturbing only one point in that matrix, which is corresponding to it ip plus one spot. All the other spots don't change. Okay, so that is so, so that update is for only that it equals. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you only have to update that row and nothing else. Let's go over the algorithm. So you start from any initial PIJ. Um, now this PIJ typically is P mu of so this P initial P0 could be a P mu to begin with because that's needed. Um, and then you can continue to update your transition probability in this way after updating the value associated with that particular mu. So what's the result? The result is that this JT would converge to J mu almost surely. Again, you need beta t to be tapering step size. Yeah. Oh, in the initial E0. But uh, that was, when initially stated, that was pick some arbitrary distribution. Is that not how the proof works? Or uh, so the paper starts with P mu. So I don't know if the proof will still hold if you started from some other initial transition matrix. Okay. So the paper starts from starts the algorithm from P mu. So what is this paper? This paper is. Um, let me write it here. So that's this paper. Okay. So this is all. This is the algorithm of the paper, and uh, rest of the paper is proving this design. <coughs> under the assumption that beta t is tapering step size. <coughs> okay. So the, the algorithm is as follows. So you start with the transition probability. Uh, if you are simulating the trajectory using that transition probability and then trying to estimate the j, it's going to take you a lot of samples. You don't want to do that. So what you do is you change the distribution itself. You change the distribution itself based on the current update, current uh, value of JT that you uh, that you have. Okay. Now remember that you had to multiply it by a weighting function. So this is your true cost that you are seeing. You multiply it by the weighting factor. So this is the ratio of the original distribution you started with uh, divided by the current function Q that you are using, the current transition function Q that you are using, right? And based on that, you update your transition function and then again update your J, then update the transition function, update J and so on. 
until you hit the terminal state. As soon as you hit the terminal state in the shortest path problem, you go back. Um, uh, you go back, start with some other random initial condition, so and then continue to run this particular algorithm. So update JT, update PD, update JT, update PD, and so on. Yeah. So the changing in the estimate of SP, can you say anything about how much faster that process converge rather than in absence of this? Uh, yeah. So this this is. Uh, uh, said to have exponential convergence property, which means that this estimate converges to J mu exponentially fast if your initial condition J0 was close to J mu. But of course, that ball in the radius is going to be quite large. If we already know the transition probability variance, you can do that also. But the question is whether you will be able to do it or not. So uh, let me try and tell you what the, what in reality it means. So let's say you are doing you have a driving simulator and you know that intersection is where the most important driving strat the driving strategy is most important at intersection. In fact, 50 percent of the fatal accidents happen at intersection. Okay, so at intersection, how you drive decides everything on your safety. So. What this algorithm is trying to do is put more weight while you are updating your uh, policy, not the policy, but while you are trying to evaluate the policy, this algorithm knows that intersections are important or at least over a period of time, this algorithm would know that intersections are important. So it will start putting more and more weight to intersections, less and less weight to other parts of the driving simulator and eventually it will convert to the JMU very fast. Now in reality, if you actually run a simulator, you will realize that the intersections are encountered very often. If you drive for two miles, you might encounter only four or five intersections. Okay, And that is just uh, 100 meters or 150 meters of driving. But that's the most critical part of driving. So what this algorithm is trying to do is give more weight to the cost accrued at intersection, less weight to all other costs. And then it's trying to estimate the overall cost for the specific driving strategy. That's the purpose of this particular algorithm. Now one thing that I still don't understand well based on my reading of the paper, whether I can pick any random PIJ to begin with, or do I need to pick P0 equals to P mu? The paper says, start from P mu and then it uses that P mu here. Okay. This is this P enters here in the weighting function. Now I'm not I'm not sure whether what happens if you start from some arbitrary distribution, what's the weighting function you're going to use. Remember in the discussion for the important sampling, W was P of X over Q of X. So Q is changing, but P is the original distribution. So I think P mu should be known and P mu appears here and P mu appears here. So their authors have initialized P0 with P mu so that they don't get into the problems. But I'm not sure how would this thing work if you didn't start from the initial condition. So that's something we need to think about. So, so the fact that J mu is J mu exponentially of all folks mu is useful, but is there an insight about us being able to say that it's non worsening if you're outside that ball all for what the other approach would have done? No. If you're outside the ball, the rate of convergence is not known, but you will still convert. Okay. So whatever that's worth. Alright, so that's all I have for today. We are talking we'll talk about stochastic approximation theorem in the next class.